but Boise of course has stepped up and is going to take us through this. So my task here is simple, it's to welcome you to this session and then to introduce these two amazing people. I'm going to have to read the introduction because some of them just have to, I can't, I can't remember all these things. But thank you for doing all these dope things. So I'll start with Catherine, she's called Catherine Biarohanga. She's a journalist with the BBC where she's been for nine years and she's been covering the Great Lakes region for the past five years. She's also very passionate about the arts and one of her stories, I guess, which is relevant to this space, the story that she did on the price of books in Kampala in Uganda and basically circulation of books. Now to Boisijay. Boisijay wa Mwesijide. Have I said that? is a Ugandan writer and lawyer and the co-founder of Chachi, which is the Center for African Cultural Excellence. That's the organization that curates this festival. Um, he has an LLB degree from Mackay University. I was, I think, four years below you at law school, right? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and a master's degree in human master's. rights from the Central European University. A master's in peace and security from King's College in London. He has taught human rights at Mackay University and Uganda Matters University, as well as law at Busoga University, St. Augustine International University, and Uganda Christian University. This is basically yeah, <laughs> five out of some of the most notable universities in Uganda he has taught at. He's the author of a chapbook called Fables Out of Nyanja. His work has appeared in literary journals, anthologies, and academic publications, including the Chimurenga, Chimurenga Chronic, Uganda Modern Literary Digest, Saraba Magazine, New Black Magazine, Afla Quarterly, The Kalahari Review, Short Story Day Africa, and the Guardian, among others. So, because I'm a bit extra, I ask people to say a few things about you because I don't want to just introduce you and leave people knowing only your books, right? So, these are some of the things that people in this room said about Boise J. He said he's quirky, he's one of the few men they know not afraid to be emotional in public. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and then I liked this one especially. She said, he is restless with his intelligence. Aww. So I think, yes. <laughs> yes, so that's Boise J. Catherine, please take us into the conversation. Okay, so thank you everyone for coming, really appreciate it. And I think this is such an important discussion because I guess the whole reason we're here is we're passionate about literature, African literature, Ugandan literature. We want to create a platform for it. We want to get it out into the world, but there is a huge challenge. And we all know that it's not easy to access it, it's expensive, um, and the ideas that maybe black people don't read, maybe you know we're trying to sell books to people who just don't want to buy them. So I guess the whole idea here is to just kind of take a stab at those issues um, and just kind of talk about them in an open way. And because Tambo is not here, partly, but also I think it should be a conversation with everyone. I think people should be free to air their views. Tambo has very, um, some people might say extreme ideas about how we can do this, and I think that would be a great basis for us to have a conversation. So where's today to introduce us to the subject? Okay, so I'm uncomfortable because the introduction was about me, <laughs> and yet I'm not supposed to be the speaker. So I'm going to talk about Tando much of the time, because this was his keynote, and also yeah. he has done the work that I haven't done. So I shouldn't, I don't qualify to give a keynote on this subject, because he's done more work on this subject. So I can't fit in his shoes, so I'll try my level best to talk about his work, because I can't speak for him. No one can speak for another person. So, um, when I met Tando in person a few months ago, um, I'm talking about meeting him because it's important how I met him. So, Mugi Wadyongo had come to Cape Town to give a, pub, to give a public lecture on decolonization because you know what has been happening in South Africa uh, since 2015, and the people based in South Africa here can correct me. University students um, were uncomfortable about 
the nature of the university, and uh, Simon Mackay is here, and he's been part of the Rhodes Must Fall movement at the University of Cape Town, Way to the People. <laughs> so, because of that unrest, which ended up in Fees Must Fall protests, so it started with students saying they don't want the statue of Cecil Rhodes on their campus because it makes them uncomfortable and reminds them of the violence of colonialism and the violence of imperialism, basically. So, every time you come, the statue used to be at the center of the campus, and every time you'd be walking on the steps, it seemed as if Cecil Rhodes was looking down on you, and, and he held very problematic views about black people, about Africans, and he was central to the colonization of the southern part of the continent. And his dream, or he had a dream that from Cape to Cairo, the whole continent would be anglicized. And so which is very problematic because having him there doesn't reflect well on where South Africa likes to tell itself his art, given that the people they consider as important. And that struggle led, that struggle later became fees must fall because um, universities were ra raising fees, which would mean that black majority black people would not afford to go to university because the economy is also racialized. Uh, at, so before this must fall, Tando had been at the Friendship Festival, which is one of the richest literary festivals on the continent. And at that particular festival, he had said that he was tired of speaking to white people. Because he would go to these festivals, he has three novels, an importance, they are me alone, and a man who is not a man, and the audience would be all white. And as a black person, and the festival is organized by white people, and this festival is sponsored by companies that are managed and owned by white people. And the questions we get as a writer, as a black South African writer, would be about his race and about black life and not about his art, not about his novel. And white writers who come to this festival would be asked questions about their novels. But for the black writers, they would be asked questions about Tell us, how does it feel to be a circumcised man? <laughs> questions that were not necessarily about his art. And also about the distribution of African books. The fact that African books do not necessarily circulate in this market, while books published in the West circulate in the same market. So after that uh, incident at Franschuk, he decided he would never attend any of those types of events. Um, then later, he announced that we were going to start a new festival, the Abantu Books Festival. And for those of you who speak Bantu languages, you know what Abantu means. Mm -hmm. So the festival for the people, because the majority of South Africans <laughs> who are black have no access to friendship. One, because of its location. Two, because of its price, and it's not marketed to them. And so one of the important things that he said at that festival was that the people in the room were majority black people should look at themselves and see at how abnormal it was that there they are in a black majority country and the whole audience is white. And yet the country has 80% or more black people. So Abantu then was started as a festival for the people, as a festival for those people who can who are not allowed in the white spaces and also the racialization of literary merit. That if a book has won awards that are judged by white people, then that book is important. If a book has, a, has won an award that has been judged by black, black people, then that book is not necessarily important. If a book is published in South Africa by a black publisher, and a book is published in the UK by white publishers, the book published in the UK gets more merit than the book published in South Africa by black publishers. So Abantu was then set up as a space where black people in South Africa could feel free. So some of the statements that Tando was making and the writings he was putting out were talking about things like the violence of coloniality, the fact that as a black person, whether reader or writer, the white gaze is just too much that you feel violated by just being in that space. Because you, you're not free enough, you don't feel comfortable enough. And eventually some people get tired and don't go to those spaces. Others continue going to those spaces and suffer in those injuries. So Abantu was a space where people can heal together, where people can talk about these books, can talk about the circulation of their own work. And black readers can be respected enough to 
have a festival where they are not on the margins. They are not asked questions like, but why are you here? Black people shouldn't be at literary festivals. So why are you here? So even if the question is not necessarily said in those terms, but that's what it actually means. That black people are not intellectual enough, black people should not be in these spaces, and if you're in those spaces, you're being white and nice. So to also say that there is an intellectual tradition, and there are black people who think, there are black people who write, there are black people who buy books, there are black people who read books. And that's how Abantu started, and the first um, edition of Abantu was curated by Banashe Chikumati, who was also part of the Fees, must, fees and Roads Must Fall movement. What Tando did was not, what Tando was saying was not necessarily new. Many people had said this from the 1950s, the 1960s, and the 1970s. What was new about what Tando was saying was saying that this is not in the past. Because most of the time, when you start talking about colonization, everyone tells you, but you won your independence. What are you talking about? You are an independent country. So you shouldn't be talking about colonialism because colonialism ended. So what Tando did was important because it's reminding us that even if we have independence, even if South Africa says they are now free, they are now um, colorless or rainbow <laughs> nation. Yeah, so they don't mind about color. They have all nations, right? sorry, all colors, right? But he's saying that it is not true. The structures still reflect that this did not end. Um, you may be asking, why are we talking about race politics and coloniality in Uganda? Because you don't have um, a big minority of white people in Uganda. You don't have the same dynamics as South Africa. But as Mamoudou Mabdani has written, the colonial experience of South Africa is not necessarily special from the rest of the continent. That white supremacy operates in almost the same ways everywhere. So the fact that blackness is perceived or projected as inferiority and weakness and bad quality, and whiteness is projected as high quality without any question. So because of that, the conversation that happens in South Africa about coloniality is still important to us. Because some of you who go to some of our bookshops, you know that when you go to a bookshop and look for a book published in Nigeria, or in Zimbabwe, only not published in America or Europe, you may not find it in any bookshop in this country. If you are looking for a book published in London, even last month, you will find it. So Arundhati Roy's book, uh, The Ministry of Atmos Happiness, is very new, very, very, very new. It is in some bookshops in this country. Books published a few years ago, in Nigeria, popular books, you don't find them in a Ugandan bookshop while we are waving the flag of independence. But as an African writer, it's easier for your book to circulate when published by a Western publisher. Because a Western publisher has access to your market more than you do. And not just your Ugandan market, but also the Kenyan market. So in terms of practical, the practical, qualities of circulating your book, you're better off with a white Western publisher because they have access to these markets. <laughs> but what does that then say about self-reliance and decolonization and independence? So every time we're celebrating decades and decades of having achieved independence, but we still don't own our markets. And we still do not control how our, how our products travel all over the world. So, that's why this talk is important, colonization talk. But that's also why we thought Tando was important to come and to share that experience. And now that he's not here, I hope that we all can share our experiences and what we can do about it. Tando has not just talked about it, he's done something that other people have not done, which is walking the talk, which includes making sacrifices. Because it means that those with the power are striking back. So finding Tando's book in South Africa, some book chains no longer stock Tando's books. Because he has talked about this. And some, of course, rest, how race politics work, some African authors, some black authors, are then preferred 
over Tando as the good blacks. And then those who are raising these issues are called the bad blacks. Not the Ugandan edition of bad blacks. <laughs> but then it means if you're going to talk about colonialism, you're going to be that ungrateful black person. That black person who, you're lucky you have a publisher. What's the problem? Why are you talking? And then there are black writers who are willing to occupy your space now that you have become the problematic one. So, and then, and this has happened not just to literature, it also happens in business. That some business people who start questioning why Unilever still supplies the margarine you have on your table at home. The detergent you use is still provided by Unilever. Barclays Bank is still in this country. And yet it was started with proceeds from slave money. The Barclay brothers were given money as compensation for stopping slaving in tribe, mm -hmm. and, um, trading in slaves. So they were bought out of the slave trade. And you have Barclays Bank in Uganda. And we're proud to have Barclays Bank account. Because it's professional. It's better. <laughs> And, and, all, and then we are crying, Barclays Bank is leaving Uganda. It means we are not desirable because white business no longer likes us. Yeah. And every one year we're celebrating independence. Look at us. <laughs> we are beautiful and we're independent. And once in a while we are fighting certain people because they are saying what we're doing is not good, right? But the standard we're using is still the same standard. And where we want to go, our stories are still directed the same way. To access our own stories, they still come through the same way. And interesting bit also is the fact that the people who publish these stories from Europe and North America do not consider us a market. So the big publishers do not necessarily send enough stock to our bookshops. So you order for an African book and they send only 20 copies. For a country with 34 million people, and so books keep selling out, booksellers are business people, so they realize there's not enough supply, and these books become very expensive. So a book that is written by an African is more expensive in Africa and much cheaper in Europe, because that is where the industry is supposed to be heading back to. And a, a, a bookseller who is trying to get a book from a white publisher has to go through books to convince them that they are worth being, they are worth, um, they are worth stocking books. And, and the more we keep saying we're independent, we should talk about our dictators, not about colonialism, the more this system remains the same. I think I've missed so much time. No, it's okay. No, it's so okay. let me stop there so that we can share our opinions. Thank you. to Tambo because Tambo takes it the next step further. He says, we need to decolonize this system. And the reason why he stopped going to festivals is that is because he said, I don't want to go to festival organizers and plead with them to have more black people. I don't want to go to them and say, please don't treat me in this way. He said, I'm just going to do away with this system. Get out of the system that exists at the moment, be it libraries in white areas, be it books, he even talks about not, if he has a library not stocking uh, Africana books, Africans books. Um, he says we need to have our own uh, libraries, we need to create our own system, and that's what he means by decolonization. It's not just going to publishers and saying, okay, you need to have more books available for Ugandan bookstores, actually, no, we need to have our own publishers and get completely out of this system. Um, and so there was an element where people thought of this as potentially racism, um, trying to create what he calls our own thing away from what exists at the moment. Am I right? <laughs> <laughs> so um, but I, think, I think it's an important point, and I think it's a good point to start talking about this, which is we all know there is a problem. There's a huge, huge, huge problem. It's his solution, which is we create our own system 
that we control, we govern, is that a better option rather than trying to plead with publishers to, to publish more voice of their books? Should I follow you? Yes. First of all, I don't think that Tando's suggested option is unique, right? So in, in terms of saying whether it's a better option or not, I think that it's an option because it's not like he's saying this in a vacuum. The, the reason why the system that he's fighting against exists is because white people created a system for themselves, right? And now, so many years later, we are complaining about it and calling out the racism and the white supremacy, right? But we still recognize that it is a model that has worked for them. We've gotten to a point where in an African country, it's easier to access literature by white people, published by white people, right? So I think that even to call his option a bit racist, I think is ignorant, because how is that racist? What is he doing? Is he now oppressing white people and stopping them from going to their festivals? Because I think the issue of racism would come up if he was now creating festivals and stopping these others from happening, because that's oppression, right? That's racist oppression. I don't think that Tando even has the power to do that to any white person. I don't think even we have the power to do that. So I think that it is an option, whether it's better or not, I won't get into that, but it is an option which we should consider, because we, we're going to keep on begging to be included in spaces. And also now I'm saying this as a feminist, because I've had experiences where, or we've seen situations where women have to beg to be included in things, and we keep getting the same excuses, right? Or it's hard to find women, and then that will continue forever. And yet if we took, which we are doing every day, right, taking initiative to create spaces in which our voices are valid, even while they're talking about including us or not, we are already doing our thing, because we're not going to stop making art because we're not being included in certain spaces. So I think in terms of just pushing African art and giving African artists a space in which we can feel secure and feel like we have to focus on creating, not necessarily explaining our presence in spaces and constantly justifying why we should be taken seriously. I think that just for the development of art alone, his option is very relevant and should be considered seriously. I don't know. <laughs> no, because at what point do the people who have more access start talking about being marginalized? Um, I don't know. Because if I were white, <laughs> if I were white and I want, I'm not getting a publisher. Right? And someone is telling me that I have privilege, but I'm not getting a publisher. What would be the easy option for me? Self publish? I'm not saying some white people are justified to say they are marginalized, but they don't see the privilege in that way. And some will tell you, I'm a good writer, this is why I'm published. Or we select the best stories. And the best stories sort of end up as white. <laughs> but then, <laughs> because I'm thinking also of the process of writing as not something that happens in a vacuum, mm -hmm. as something that is itself privileged from the beginning. Because access to books from a young age is a privilege. Mm -hmm. Who are your parents? What are they? Every morning you want to go and read a book and they're telling you, you have to go and fetch water. Yeah. There is no water. This child, what's wrong with this child? They are weak. <laughs> you need to go and cook. So, what, do you have access to books and which dreams do you dream? The primary school I went to, which dreams did I dream? Did I dream of becoming a writer in future? Did I have any writers to refer to? Or did I dream of becoming a radio presenter because we listen to the radio? Does every family listen to the radio? Did I dream of becoming a television presenter who had no television set in our house? How could I dream of becoming a television presenter if I don't even know what television is? So I, I, I want to, I think more of the wholesome experience, not just the access, but what visions are available and to whom? 
And the entitlement some people feel that you, we know you're good at sports. We know you're good at, at that. We don't know you to be good at books. So there are people who have been in schools with many races and they have been told, you have international schools in this country. You can run. You can play football. You, can, you want to read the book. You want to be in the library. You want, to, you want your school to send you to a festival like this one. Because schools select students to send to the festival. And they are saying, oh, we don't think you're going to end up as a writer. We think you're going to end up as an athlete. That's where you, how do they call it? Competitive advantage? <laughs> That's why you can compete. You won't compete in this. And those ideas are racialized. Mm -hmm. Or in Uganda class. Yes, racialized and class. So in Uganda, you know, when, when you're middle class and, and you live a certain lifestyle, they say, ah, in that family, they live like white people. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's true. That's true. So what is the image of being black and African and, and privileged? Which is also problematic, but very, very, very problematic. But, but that, the imagination of the writers you're reading, majority of us, when we're asked our best books, we're going to say John Grisham. Yeah. We're going to say Daniel Steele. Some of us, I didn't say all of us. Some of my friends, every time I ask them their best writer, they say John Grisham. When I, I did literature in secondary school, I'm going away from that. I did literature in secondary school, and the books were doing, the set books, were books by Shakespeare. There were those, and then there, were, there was Achene, there was Mbuki, Tabitek, and then most of my friends would have Daniel Steele. Most of my friends would have Daniel Steele and John Grisham. And they're saying, ah, these syllabus books are fake. These books by African writers are fake. The cool thing is reading Grisham under the covers, right? So, it's complex. Do you want to be how many of us in school wanted to be Ngugis and Achilles as opposed to Grishams and Daniel Steeles? I did. Ah, let me be frank. Let me be frank. My Achilles moment came much later in life. <laughs> so because to be frank at all, what vision, what, what, what is the image of success? What is the image of literary success? Which was on the, the second hand book market, apart from the books on the syllabus. How many romance books are written by black or African writers on our second-hand book market? <laughs> and why? Is it that we are not writing romance? No. Yeah. But why is it, I know that so, so this is the point, this is where I want to push us. Because I think, and maybe that's the problem with Tando's festival, it's something that might happen, which is we have black writers in a room all lamenting and saying, oh, this whole system is bad, and then that person says, yes, and do you know what happened to me, this happened to me? But I think what he's also pushing at, I think, is about the systems, yeah. the way everything works. And it's not enough for everybody to just say, it's crap, it's crap, we all know that. But what do you do about it? And how do you completely revamp the system? And there have been older black South African writers who said you can't just blame whiteness, you can't just blame white privilege. And their perspective is that you have had a black government in South Africa for 20 years. What are they doing about it? That, that's what, how they respond to him. Don't shoot me, people. That's <laughs> their perspective. Um, so their perspective is, OK, black people, they're rich. They're billionaires in South Africa who are black. What are they doing about it? So yes, there is a huge gap in the privilege, but you can't just sit there and lament and have a festival where you just say, oh, it's bad, we're here, we love each other, we're great. <laughs> but how do you move beyond that point? Mm -hmm. I'm saying is, as a black writer, you can either say, I am a victim of a system, or you can say, I will create a new system, yeah. one that works, you understand? So Mark, exactly what you said now, that's what I pointed out in the blog piece. I said South Africa has got billionaires, black billionaires, Right? And they would much rather spend that money on going into sanctity and having a blast than setting up a literary festival. I, I, I pointed out that I was at the time of the writer in Durban some years ago, 
and at that festival, Susan Abuna was there, Palestinian Order Society, the Muslims, huge supporters of Palestine. Good, awesome, right? We want to be on the side, the right side of history always. But she had a session, and all the nights that I'd been at the festival, the audience was predominantly white. I was maybe one of two or three Indians in the audience. There were a few black people. That was it. And I mean, this festival is accessible because it's in the middle of the city, and the tickets are dirt cheap. Like, they go for nothing, right? But there were no black people in the audience, right? And there were black authors there. There were no Indian people in the audience. But the night that Susan Abuzawa appeared, that night, that auditorium was just packed with Muslim people, right? So after the whole thing, everyone went to her, got their, their, their uh, copy signed, took their pictures, whatever. Once that was done, interval, they all went home. What about the authors that came after that? Did they have nothing important? Of those authors, one of them was an Indian Muslim South African. Did she have nothing important to say? You get what I'm saying? So people will choose. I mean, and, and people could say that okay, people don't write books because they're expensive, but that's not true. I love being a Muslim community, but it's fairly well off. And I know that people would rather go and buy a designer pair of jeans than go buy a book, even yeah. though it costs four times as much. Yeah. Right? So I don't think it's an issue of cost. I don't think it's an issue of accessibility. I don't think it's an issue of those, or even an issue of the way the whole structure works. I think it's an issue of the values we impart to our kids from early on. And I think that's where we have to begin. We need to give kids an understanding of the value of Um Hi. Um, I passed a wonderful mail message. This is nice. One of the conversations, you know how the festival happens outside the actual mm -hmm. sessions? But one of the comments that has been coming has been how nice it is to have a more black presence this year, congratulations, um, our attention free zone to talk about the actual issues, and this is one of them. Um, growing up, my sister once asked me, what do you want to be? I was about seven, and I said, I want to be a Mnyangkore when I grow up. <laughs> 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 I am volunteering. 
But if you're coming to me with a skill set, yes, and you're saying, come and do this job, pay me professionally. Yeah. Regardless of whether I'm black or white, whether I did it the other day for free, what am I getting at? I'm getting at the issue of economic empowerment. Until we have set economic structures or a background, everyone as an artist, whether it is going back to fund the lands that we have, to be able to get away from a system of survival where this artistic access is the only thing we have to earn bread and butter, it's not going to happen. We're going to continue looking at this white face as the problem and forgetting all the time that actually you need to earn a basic income to give you a roof over your head where you play jazz music and write or just create art free of all the encumbrances. Yes, crisis creates a new kind of inspiration, but also we are a bit beyond that point. Yes, there is yesterday, it informs today, but we are beyond that. Um, <laughs> thank you very much. Sorry. Okay, sorry. Um, I, I understand what you're saying, right? And I guess my interpretation of what you, you say in short, <coughs> the too long age read version is more than right? And I think that it's possible to talk about moving on, right? But we live in a country where, in this day and age, 2017, right, women are still bleaching their skin, right? You will talk to a black child who still tells you that black people don't read, right? So even beyond the question of economically empowering ourselves, I think the conversation of decolonizing goes beyond just the system, right? It extends to ourselves as well, because these are things that we were taught. We were taught to believe in these ways. So if we continue to have the conversation from the perspective of move on, I don't think that we give ourselves the time to sit, actually sit with just how fucked up we are as a society, not just within the art spaces, right? If we're constantly telling people move on, move on, move on, when do we get to unpack the fact that as a dark skinned woman, I'm still not the standard of anybody's standard of beauty in Uganda, and beyond not being their standard, people have a problem with stopping me on the street and being like, mm-hmm. You're beautiful, you're You're missing the point. You see, they so throw so that at you for the sake No, but I know that I'm beautiful. Do you understand? I know that. But there are probably like a few people in this room who don't believe that I'm beautiful. You understand that very many Ugandans don't believe that I'm beautiful. When they think beautiful, they don't see me, right? When writers, when you write about God, are you writing about Jaja Mwanga or are you writing about the white man with blonde blue eyes, like blue eyes and blonde hair sitting on a throne that we learned about in catechism school, right? So I think that these issues go beyond just the do we have access to spaces and whatever. It also goes to the work that we are doing. So I'm interpreting what you say as a call to us Right? Not just to move on, but also to start doing the work within ourselves that makes it, that at, at the end of the day, will make this conversation irrelevant. Okay, the lady in the green jacket. Hi. Uh, <laughs> hi. Um, um, I'm so privileged. Wherever I look at my young ears, I used to go to the library at the age of six. We were told, remove your center, take to a library, then we go and read. Then it stopped for a while. Then when I got to standard five, I my first book, the book that I fell in love with was The Poor Child, Stephen in Prince in Nigeria. And from then, I've been reading African writers. It is not that I don't read Nora Roberts. I don't read Zoroastrian. I do read them too, and I do enjoy their art. But I stick to my African writers, Baba Kimenyi, my favorite. Mm-hmm. I stick to Louis of Normal. <coughs> I stick to them. So what is my point here? My point is, how are we training our kids? How are we training each other? You see, if I had been trained to read the Bisham right from six years. Till now, I'll be sticking to him. And wherever we are having a forum, I stand and say, I don't like, I, I read, I, I love African writers. And people are like, you are missing the fun. And I'm like, what's fun? You don't read these romance books? And I'm like, I read them. Only that I find it fine to talk about people I can relate with. When Bobby Wadomo writes about 
uh, the river between. I can actually travel to Pika and see the river between. But now when Grisham is missing out of something, well, my in order to be colonized, uh, whatever we want to be colonized, let's start from training the kids that buy them. If you buy them two, uh, the generation, buy two African books and one generation, it's fine. <laughs> someone who believes issues such as migration, uh, the rights of the LGBT community, other stories that perhaps the ones I relate with more than a story from pre-colonial Africa or post-colonial uh, Africa, I think it is quite important for the so-called African writer to now move away from it. Every time I pick up an African book, I get a sense that there is a, a box where you need to belong there for the book to be African. I know there are attempts uh, from, from a couple of writers to, to say, maybe let's go action, let's talk about from us. But that's the exception. So I think for as long as we assume it is African if we're tackling colonialism before my father was born, the issue is there. What are the stories we are telling to serve this market? We're talking about training our children. 
are, are we going to throw PBTech at them or movie was? Those are beautifully written books. They are relevant, but maybe those are stories that will not resonate with them. So maybe decolonization of African literature has a lot to do with the stories we're telling. Yeah, the other argument is also the people who decide on the type of African books that should be written and published yeah. may also have a particular perspective on what the African story is. So there might, be, there might be a writer who has a beautiful story to tell about, you know, science, innovation in Uganda, but they'll go to a publisher in London and they'll say, they have science That's not African, actually. Do you think Ugandan writers maybe are just a bit chilled out and they're like, oh, you have to read, you have to read, and the person's like, well, I don't have time to read. Do you think more needs to be done in terms of that perspective? I don't know. <laughs> One of the reasons I don't know is because while listening to the, con con the contributions, I've been thinking about the legitimacy of the decision not to read. <laughs> Which makes me unpopular in this room because everyone is reading and they want everyone to read. But the idea that you have to, if you're consuming literature, it must be in a book. Right. And you must buy the book. That's right. What about the people who are reading stories on Facebook? Yeah. When we say people are not reading, what are we exactly saying? How are we, what is the core thing? Are we requiring them to read in a certain way? And therefore we are frustrated because they are not reading in a certain way? Can there be many ways of reading? So I'm thinking about Stella Nyasi actually. <laughs> And the people who read Stella Nyanzi every single day. Yes. And who then pick a novel? Where do we put them? Are we going to tell them, you guys, you're not taking Stella Nyanzi and therefore you're not proper readers? And also going back to how stories are consumed. What about musicians? Or what about self published? Evangelical preachers. Because <laughs> I've been thinking of how many people buy rich dad for that. How many people have read Joyce Meyer's pamphlets in this very country? And I don't know. So, do we need also to decolonize what we mean by literature? Literature for who? Literature for what purpose? Is literature only the textbook in the school? Uh, and nowadays, as you know, if you're going to have a story going to primary schools or secondary schools that have certain content, you're going to have the headmasters and the Minister of Education telling you you're teaching children bad manners. So where do we draw the line? And how do we think about this sector without feeling like, I read books in print, and I read the, the so-called literary fiction, and therefore I'm smart, and the rest of you, yeah. The selfies but I, books that happen. Every time somebody has a new book, they yeah. take a selfie yeah. with it. And you never actually know if they actually read the book. Ah. <laughs> 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 but then, like, I'm trying, so I'm trying to like find a solution. So in terms of, of, um, of Facebook and WhatsApp and the rest, so what, what Facebook and Google have done now is they're not saying let's wait for 10 years for these you know, Africans <coughs> to get on to be able to access the internet. Let's not, let's not wait for 10 years till Ugandans are richer. What they're doing is they're coming here and laying the fiber optic cables in Uganda. So under us in Kampala now, we have a lot of cables that have been built by Google that now Smile users, Airtel users, what Facebook is doing is going to Arua and actually laying cables in Arua to Congo, to CAR, to get more Africans onto the internet so we use their products. So are we thinking in that perspective or are we just saying, oh, you must be on, you know, just buy the book, buy the book. We're not allowing, we're not creating enough of an environment where people can actually access. Even Facebook, Facebook is a luxury in Uganda. You can go to so many places in this country, you cannot access the internet. If you can access the internet, you just get a beep of WhatsApp on your, on your phone, like one message, you can't even download a picture. In so many places in this country, 
And so if we're thinking of people reading, we need to get out of this Kampala bubble, which is you can walk down the streets, there's a bookshop. People live in places where for you to actually access a book is, even in a school, you can access a book in a school. So are we thinking beyond that? I think that's what Tando is trying to do, is to get out of this room and just say, okay, we need to read. But we, and, and that's why I'm pushing it back to you, Ghana writers, are you thinking beyond but also to, to add to that before you answer, and I think this goes back to what Song is saying, beyond just decolonizing in terms of the spaces that artists occupy and that they can access, who are our artists, right? Because he raised the issue of relatability, mm -hmm. and I think you kind of raise it as well when you talk about the people who will read Stella Nyanzi, right? Mm -hmm. But won't necessarily come and buy a book mm -hmm. here and read it, right? So who are we seeing as the writers whose work is being brought to us and given to us? Mm -hmm. People read Stella Jazzy, a lot of people read her because they relate with the things that she writes about, right? And because of these issues, I guess, that Tando was trying to address and now with this conversation that we're having about decolonization, I think those issues have also led to a very specific set of African writers being brought forward as yeah. these are the people writing about Africa, right? They're usually straight, they're usually men, they're usually Christian, wow. right? <laughs> so, what are the stories that we're being given? I'm not interested in reading stories about one set of people every day, all day, for this publisher, you understand? So how does that also fit into that? Yeah. <laughs> I don't have answers. <laughs> I, think, I think it's a political question at the end of the day. Because all these things, why is Google setting up the fiber optic? It's not to our good. They are doing business. Facebook, they are doing business. There is no free lunch, I think. <laughs> so I don't know. Why would our dear president support the arts and literature as opposed to the Pentecostals? Why? What is the need for him? Because I think also we, including myself here, most of us have a sense of entitlement in the sense that we expect people, because this is important, we expect them to pay attention. But what is the interest? Why should Mr. Yoweri Kabutan Seven, who is a writer, who has published, okay, an author, who has published a lot of things, who, who has been part of two translation projects, who was part of a project that translated uh, they made a translation dictionary. Yeah. He wrote, he co-wrote a thesaurus. At a personal level, this is a person interested in these things. What is his interest at a public government level in these things? I think these are political questions at the end of the day. When you have political, and political here is white to mean economic as well. Who is losing if the things we are talking about come out? Who is benefiting? Who benefits from the narrative of African fiction as too serious and dealing with issues? <laughs> Who loses when we start to read? Kasama Republic has um, an imprint that publishes romance. Yeah. What happens when we know that, oh, someone is, is crashing on someone else on Kampala Road as opposed to somewhere else? What happens? What industry is benefiting? What industry is losing? How many of us go to London for the first time and feel comfortable, even when they've never been there? Because it's familiar. You've read about it. How many of us have watched these movies and even if you've never been to the US, you can go to the US and you're at home? <laughs> Who benefits from these stories? Who loses when these stories are not there? So when, how many of us celebrated? Okay, maybe I'm going to but how many of us celebrate each time a western best film company makes a movie about Uganda how many of us look down on Ugandan made movies how many of you are curious about Nyanja where I come from <laughs> because you've read my work how many of you are curious about India because you've read Arundhati Ray's work so and who benefits when you go to India it may not directly be Arundhati Roy because when you buy her book, how, many, how much is she going to get from royalties? But there's a whole economic setup that is benefiting from this. Who, I don't know, I think it's complex, but I also think we need to go deeper to the larger picture 
and the politics and the economics of this. Who is investing and to get what? How are we investing? Because I think what Tando has done is to politicize the literary sector. Because a lot of us just think, oh, you are best writer, and everyone has a full stop. But the politics of even choosing who is the best writer is important. Who determines good and for who? And that's a political question. You can't just say, move on, I have a white friend, I have a black friend, I'm not problematic. You can't move to that. Because there's a structure where people lose, people get, I can't take it to you, it's so expensive. And I take it to certain countries, it's so cheap. And they are so far away. And that is political. And that's economic. And this, whether literature, whether fashion, whether how many of us are wearing brands from somewhere else, all these things are connected, I think. And we are losing and benefiting, but we can't just single it out and say, bring Bobby Wine, he's a great guy. Bring Stella Nazi, great woman. Bring so and so, great person. I don't think that solves anything. Or me as a person, I have white friends, I have black friends, I have straight friends, I have um, <laughs> LGBTI friends, and therefore, what do you say that are problematic? Mm -hmm. I don't think it's that simple, but I also think we need to do more work in terms of all these things. Why do I prefer that place and not? We no longer have an indigenous Ugandan bank, do we? Yeah. <laughs> Centenary is owned by the Vatican. <laughs> so I think it's deeper, and I think we can't opt out, yeah. but also we can't simplify, yeah. we have which we are doing, right? Yeah. yeah, thank you. So we have like 18 Eight. minutes. Yeah. Um, so there's a gentleman in the black shirt. Oh, there's also someone behind them. Oh, Doreen. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, black shirt, Doreen, and the gentleman at the back. Okay, we've got 18 minutes. Hopefully we can get more. Okay, yeah, I'll just use I think the decolonization agenda has to be understood as being constructionist. Yeah, it's, it, it's constructionist in that we have to be deliberate about it and intentional about it. Because colonization was that way. We were told we were less than the other as a construction. It's not that we were that. We were on a path of evolution that was interrupted and, and they, 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 they made us who we are, you know? And uh, the other is that, and, and so we have to be deliberate in constructing our stories and saying we are a people, we have pride, we are a people of identity, we know that. And, and, and so it can't be that you're, you're just looking at it from the things that are, are making the headlines today, so LGBT and stuff like that. Because these are stories that have been given to you. This is an agenda that is being pushed for you. And that's why we go back into history, because I'm referring to what you were saying, you know, why, why they need to go back to history and pre colonial because that's where the damage was done, you know. And when you can get from there and know the damage that was done, then you can begin to reconstruct the, the African identity. And, and, and like what you were saying, it's it gets to a state where it becomes political and the writer is no longer just doing it for fun, but he's a politician. And maybe that's the point that maybe historically the best writers are probably political writers, the best books are probably political books. And not just maybe put politics in the past, but these things, as everybody said, are still happening today. So can you not create, you know, things fall apart of today? Do we still have to go back to the point I was making just briefly was how do we make these stories relevant to the people who want to read today? Because it is one thing to, to, to state your story from the 1960s and it is another for an 18 year old to relate to that story. So how do we make the issues, like you're saying, maybe there are agendas that are being pushed, but how, would we, how do we tell those stories from, from a perspective that appeals to these people now, the relatability? That was my point.
what is racial power and what is economic power, which will be much more clearer answers in South Africa, but I'm going to do that. that it is that, is that uh, what's the word? Those two things so clearly together. That the racial, that the economic power is all in the one kind of government. And I feel that it's more useful to focus on a specific problem and then discuss that and try to break it down, let's say publishing. And then see what the causes are, what the problems are. But otherwise, we've been for years and years and years discussing these issues of the organization and they've stayed very general. One of the things I think we can look at is maybe the Black American experience, who have had to do these things for many, many years before us. And many have gone the way of setting up their own systems, their own publishing companies, their own restaurants, their own and in some ways, these have also promoted, um, for example, black writers that we've known about. So there, there is something in what Tundo is saying? Tundo, yes. About creating our own, our own structures where we can pay attention and, and, and sort of um, uh, what? critique and find value in what is relevant. But that doesn't mean, I don't see it as opposition. I think it can exist also with these platforms because we are dealing with real economic structure and we're not going to break it down tomorrow. If I bank with Buckley, if I bank with Crane, if I bank with Crane, I'm lost all my money. I'm not saying Buckley is better. But these are deep structural things. For example, you know, Uganda is indigenous, won't be able to put those five pages. So are we going to now not use the Facebook or Google or Facebook people? That's not realistic. Now that they are there, how can we best use these systems for our own uh, benefit? How am I going to use the internet for my own benefit? By the way, to the Facebook, they all use the stories. I would like the discussion, if possible, to be a bit more specific and we have a whole round of it. So it's not just talking to each other and you know, enjoy the sound of our business. You'll be one on publishing. You'll be one on publishing. Okay, great. Wonderful. So it's going to be at the back, yeah. Wait, she was, she's innocent. No, no, sorry, I pointed to Adam's in Adam's. I saw his first one. Yes, uh, I'm going to write this at the decolonization show. Because people have a lot of information of that. Also, another poem, if I, if I can answer what was said, I can be more specific. The problem with being specific is that we can talk about publishing, but when the colonizers came, they came with different avenues. They, 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 they each helped each other with one goal, which was to conquer Africa. They used, <coughs> sorry, they used every Every angle, yes, every figure that 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 they could, that, that, they had, that they could use, that, 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 that they could use. So even as you find that when you talk about one avenue, you end up colliding with the economics, the politics, education, and all those things. So we have to accept that we have to be broad-minded and look at it as a big picture. Then that person who's dealing with publishing deals with that. The one who's dealing with media deals with that. And yeah, each person can only individual thing, but knowing that at the end of the day, the main force of every system is the West, and that's how it is. So me one thing, and even being decolonized, for me, it's something that even started later on in my life. And it's a personal thing, and I'm still decolonizing myself by self-introspection, thinking why do I like certain things? Who what incepted it in my mind? What is it that, that put it as a why should I have an idea that this is beautiful and that is not? And then, based on how I see, I should know that, okay, is it something that I was, that I was told or is it something that I believe in? So we need to really look at our culture. And also, it's, this is something that I that always tell the youth. I say that if you are born, especially if someone is black, I say if you are born and Negro in this world, you are not a disadvantage. Deal with it. So you must know that I have got, it's like running a marathon and you know that someone is 30 meters in front of you. And then you say, I want to run at the exact uh, acceleration of velocity that they're running at. You will never pass them. You have to run faster than them. 
then you say it's not it's not fair. Uh, we all we are all human. We regard the rest at the same time. Hey, 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 maybe then someone took them in a car, put them in front of you. But then the reality is that we are in Africans are poor, blacks are poor. But what are you doing? You must you must say I am at a disadvantage, and there's something I must do, and I must work harder than if I was one. And then okay, but then the, the last thing also I'd like to say is that each each team also needs a different approach. Like what Hadley is doing, I support that. But what he's doing in another industry, we know what separating ourselves and saying we want to talk to ourselves. It, especially in sports, it's sports that we want to say we have our own world cup. <laughs> but then people say you're not the best. Until you beat Messi, until you beat Ronaldo, you will not be the best. The best way you can be the best to play is by being against them. So you cannot separate yourself. But in literature, I think you can. You know. In a sense, and so these last two points, then we have to close. I just wanted to comment on the reading culture in Uganda in particular. I think that some of the systems that are in place and were not created by us continue to be upheld by us. For example, um, I find that we downplay a lot of other genres and consider them as less compared to, say, literary fiction. Um, Lillian referred to it as popcorn, shall I say? But popcorn is important. It's important to have African writers writing about love, about the mundane things, about walking down a Kampala street. Like, these are the things that are going to make more people read. Because I feel like we're really in the journey, and you're not going to jump right into Chinua Achebe. You have to start somewhere else. Personally, as a child, I started with, you know, Peter and Jen, the usual thing, and I was lucky enough to read some of Barbara Chimene's work, um, the Moses series. And after that, continuing onwards, once I had read that African literature from a child's perspective, continuing onwards, I wanted to read adult African literature. So that brings me to the point of, I think we need more writers writing stories for children, because if someone grows up reading, they're going to continue with that culture onwards. So, yeah, that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, they say you can only begin until you start. Uh, normally, there's always the beginning of things. Uh, for example, we know in history that uh, the white people we are talking about did not start the way they were. For example, there was a, move, a, a time when uh, only the Arabs used to write. And then the, the, the movement started, the, uh, people who are translating from Arabic to Latin and then from Latin to uh, these uh, Western languages. Now, uh, I looked around and uh, I didn't see any Chikonyogo, I didn't see any Get down these uh, this kind of books that uh, uh, people familiarize with, like uh, local languages. If we are discussing about colonization, but we have not talked about the languages. How are we supposed to write only in English, or we can also write in local languages? So, um, I mean, uh, there are many ways. Uh, if you are to, if you are, if we are to become more into more writers, then. then we have to think uh, more and more and understand that uh, there's, a, there's always a movement. For example, Chinua uh, Chinua's time, they were talk, talking about colonization. Now, the, the topics are different. So if you have writers talking about today's issues, like others have said, you see they are, the writing will become popular. People will be buying these books, even if they are not uh, published by uh, Western publishers, people will be looking at them. If you look at uh, Tamale Mirugi, if, some, if somebody goes to Tamale and tries to add, uh, make, make him more scholarly, people will start to buy, people will love it, and you see, you can, everything will be like, good, thank you very much. Okay, I, as regards the conversation, I do not know whether we've done justice to it, especially because Stan was not here and we did not have a South African perspective, which was, I was hoping for. But part of what Tritivism is doing is that, I mean, we had Saleha's perspective. Uh, I would have loved to listen to Simon Rake, Kwezi Kize, Chris Ouma, but they are here for the festival. Um, JJ Bona has something that he likes to say, that hype your writers as you do your rappers. 
which I think is a good way to conclude. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you everyone for coming.